the Gilda's maximum lawyers community of legal entrepreneurs who are taking their businesses and lives to the next level. As a Guild member, you'll build relationships, be held accountable, and learn strategies specifically designed to get you unstuck and accelerate your plan for growth. Members are also granted exclusive access to masterminds hosted around the country. Our next event is coming up, and we're heading to Scottsdale, Arizona. There's something truly magical about the power of these in-person connections where real-time breakthroughs happen. Picture this. You're surrounded by like-minded law firm owners tackling your business and mindset challenges together. The energy is electric, the insights are transformative, and the results are game-changing. Investing in yourself is the best decision you'll ever make. The knowledge, strategies, and breakthroughs you'll gain are priceless assets that will supercharge your practice and propel you forward. Join the Guild and secure your ticket to Scottsdale at the best possible price by visiting maxlawevents.com. This is Greg Crabtree with Car Riggs and Ingram. I'm the author of Simple Numbers, Straight Talk, Big Profits, and uh, happy to be on the Maximum Lawyer podcast. Run your law firm the right way. The right way. This is the Maximum Lawyer podcast. Maximum Lawyer podcast. Your hosts, Jim Hacking and Tyson Mutrix. Let's partner up and maximize your firm. Welcome to the show. Welcome back to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. I'm Jim Hacking. And I'm Tyson Mudrix. What's up, Jimmy? Well, it looks like you're rolling to St. Louis. I just got back from my daughter's softball game. We're here with Greg Crabtree. This is someone we've been wanting to get on the show for a while. We're really excited to have him. I think that this is going to be a really valuable episode for our listeners. So, Greg, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Glad to be able to speak to your audience. Greg, we are super, super excited to have you on. Uh, we're going to get into the book. We're going to ask questions about that. But before we get to that, tell us about your journey. We like to ask our guests to talk about their journey and how they got to where they are and maybe even mention why you wrote the book. Yeah, I mean, I think it is one of those things that actually, because I'm speaking to a group of professionals that, you know, lawyers you know, have a very similar business model structure to accounting firms. And, and so we, we all have our our demons that we have to face in terms of we, we get caught up in our profession versus we really ought to be thinking like an entrepreneur, in my opinion. And I was fortunate enough, I was kind of always a frustrated accountant. I, I, I look at the accounting profession and, and we make it way too darn hard on entrepreneurs to run their business because to be quite honest, more times than not, we have our clients working for us instead of us working for them. And and, and it's just a backwards relationship. And, and so, you know, kind of, I'm kind of driven to say, listen, you know, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be something that is, creates a, you know, a nice balanced in, uh, environment between the services you deliver and the value you provide and, and the success, you know, the people that you work with. And I was fortunate enough to get introduced to an organization called the Entrepreneurs Organization back in 2001. And EO just, turn my thinking around because, you know, I started hanging out with entrepreneurs instead of accountants. And uh, so that changes your thinking. And I was really fortunate that, you know, my in, in EO, you meet with a smaller group once a month at California Forum. And, and those guys were kind of, you know, my focus group to tell me what sucks about the accounting profession. And fortunately, I, I think we decided to listen to them. We, we couldn't do business with them. It's kind of a safe environment. But it was really great feedback, you know, and, and it's something that both of our professions need to hear that, you know, there's the natural things in our profession is, you know, they said number one thing is I don't like the April 15th tax day surprise, which in many cases the October 15th surprise as well. Nobody likes that. And there's a way to, to fix that. Secondly, though, they said we don't like being billed by the hour. Now, you know, and that's a case where I know in the legal profession, quite a few of our, our legal clients you know, that we work with have state laws that prevent them from billing any way other than hourly, and that presents a little bit of a challenge. But whenever you can bill on a fixed price basis, you create an economic equilibrium that you're billing for the value of what you do rather than charging by the hour, because it's in my talks all the time. If you bill by the hour, there's only two possible outcomes. You either gave away your expertise or you charge for your ignorance. And, you know, and that that's that's just not good. And, and so at the end of the day, you got to find a way, you know, that, you know, creates a fair outcome for both parties. But the last piece, and I think this is kind of the secret sauce that in our practice is, you know, they said, oh, by the way, you have 
hundreds, you see hundreds and hundreds of businesses, most intimate details, more so than any, any, you know, person that the business will deal with. And, and you ought to have some idea what works and what doesn't. And to me, that was a damning indictment of our profession that we have some of the most sensitive data in the world that we can learn from, that we let it go right in front of our face, doing a tax return or doing some mundane thing that the marketplace needs, but we let the most valuable thing just walk right in front of us and we didn't notice it. And it really drove me to, you know, start studying client data, you know, and that's what we, we base both of the, the my books on, Simple Numbers, Straight Talk, Big Profits, and Simple Numbers 2.0, is nobody's paying me to do it, you know, so I had to choose to spend time to study data. And now one of the things that probably drives the greatest demand on our client calls every month is the clients are asking us, what do we see? We've turned that corner to where they don't look at us as an accountant anymore. They look at us as a, a market seer of what do we see in the data because we actually maintain a hundred company model now that since our practice is all over the U.S., we, we, we're not geographically dependent with our client base nor industry dependent. And so we get we have a nice basket of 100 companies that we opine on with our clients every month to say, hey, here's what we're seeing. Here's what we're seeing inflation. Doing. Here's what we're seeing labor doing. Here's what we see other operating costs. Here, here's where we see deficiencies in pricing strategies you know, that are developing in the market. Here's a deficiency in capitalization of businesses that are starting to over rely on debt where they, they were cash flush you know, in times past. And those have become incredible insights for our clients. It's just not a common thing that our profession is known to provide. Greg, before we dive into the book and the lessons of the books, why do you think law schools and business schools do such a poor job of teaching their students how to think like entrepreneurs? Well, it, it's a great question, and I think it applies. It doesn't matter if it's law schools or medical schools or accounting schools. I mean, accounting schools don't teach accountants how to be, you know, partners in a firm either. And let's face it. I mean, you know, the, the world of business, when information didn't exist, it was about who had sway and who had advantage over somebody. And the goal seemed to be in business was who could really get value when they didn't have to work for it. And, and, and so... You know, not call me Don Quixote tilting at windmills. I kind of like the idea of the balance of if you provide value, you should get compensation. If you provide no value, you shouldn't get any compensation. And there's a lot of range in between. And the vast weaknesses of profession business models is where somebody is getting overcompensated for the value that they provide. Now, value comes in the forms of multiple streams of activity. There's four things that actually happen in business. The first thing that happens is marketing. There ha you know, no business transaction in the world happens without marketing of some sort. It may not be paid. It may be a person knocks on the door. Uh, it may be you know, taking a, a potential client to, to, to lunch or dinner, whatever. But there's marketing. Marketing must always precede sales, which is interesting because we always say sales and marketing. Well, that's just because the salespeople are good at convincing us that sales comes before marketing. And that's not true. So... <laughs> you know, salespeople are really good at convincing you they need to be paid more when they probably didn't earn it. But sales, getting to contract comes second. Oversight of the activity comes third. And then the product, the actual product or service delivery comes fourth. As a general rule, this was the, the guy that got me into EO was a client of mine that had built a business model uh, built on delivering rapid prototype parts. Next day, you would upload a, your CAD file to their site, get an instant quote, and you'd get a you know, an instant prototype you know, delivered to your business the next day. And, and this guy was one of the best entrepreneurs I've ever gotten to know and became a really good friend as well. And, and, and he, we, we took this theory from him. So I got to give Ron Hollis, this is the guy's name, and, and I got to give him credit for it. He, he said, you know, really, if you think about a business transaction of those four things, marketing's worth about 20%, sales is worth about 10%, oversight's worth about 10%, and the product or service is worth about 60%. And you can plus or minus it a percent or two either direction, but that's a pretty good beginning framework of activity value. And so I shouldn't be getting comp and if I'm not delivering the service, that 60% of the value in our professions world of doing the, the task that, that's needed you know, for our client, well, am I doing oversight? Am I doing sales, getting contract? Am I doing marketing you know, to keep the funnel going? Or am I living off of residual value where I'm continuing to get paid, but I didn't have to do anything for it? And every business, regardless of every, every professional business that we've worked with and that we break down and we analyze, 
our pro simple numbers process just exposes those weaknesses. Now, when you expose it, you got a problem to deal with. And, you know, to be quite honest, sometimes those are the hard conversations that people need to have of going, you know, listen, I can't keep paying you, you know, this money because you're not continuing to bring it in. And, and the, the, the value of doing, if you've got a, a ongoing client relationship, you know, I, I can't keep paying for it every year for the rest of that client's life. There's a value to getting it in the door, but more value of keeping it is, are you good at delivering service? Now there's ongoing, you know, marketing, so to speak, of customer uh, satisfaction and, and customer connection and those kind of things. But, but you've really got to look at it in a way that there's a way to ascribe value to each one of those functions. And then you have to hold each person accountable, you know, to those activities. Now, as I said in the first book, and it's become kind of the, 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 the opening salvo of our simple numbers philosophy, is this. You get paid a salary for what you do, you get a return on what you own. I, I can't stress enough how the professions industries do not understand that, that there is a value for me being an owner. What did I give up to get my ownership? Did I do sweat equity? Did I go without full compensation? Did I put cash in? all of those types of things. That, that is worth something. Once you get equity, it's worth something, and somebody's got to pay you something to get it away from you, you know, in, in that point. And I, and I respect that. And in a lot of deals that we go in and analyze where somebody's got an equity that they probably didn't deserve, it's like, well, you just, it's tough. I mean, you, you just got a bad deal. You got to buy them out or, or work something, you know, to get, get away from them because, you know, there, there's people that do get ownership that probably didn't deserve it. You know, but at the end of the day, as long as you understand that framework of salary for what you do, return on what you own, you've got to keep the cow healthy. That entity that everybody works through and gets their salary, you know, most professions work off of a drain the swamp approach at the end of the year and they take all the cash out. They live off a line of credit until they build it back up, you know, in the middle of the year. And it's just a dumb idea. You, you they're, they're massively undercapitalized. And the ones that we flipped the corner and taught them how to keep the entity profitable and be fully capitalized, they become far more sustainable in turbulent times to, to be able to do that. And they have fair compensation across their partner base and their producer base to make sure that people are being paid for what they produce to. And, you know, it's no different than, than the NFL and Major League Baseball and, and any of the pro sports teams. You know, when you have a crappy season, all of a sudden you're a free agent. And you don't you don't get paid what you were making. So it is about production. And sad to say, most practitioners are dreaming of the day that they can make the salary that they're making and not have to work to do it. Well, I'm sorry, that's just that, that just makes no economic sense. So, Greg, I, I think this is great. I, I want to kind of stay on this topic because you talk about this in the book and you talk about equity and you talk about salary. But something that Jim and I see all the time is people will give up a big chunk of their firm, they'll bring on a partner. And mm -hmm. when you talk about the dynamics of, of, of equity, when it comes to sweat equity, when it comes to mm -hmm. salary, but then also what you give up whenever you bring on a partner and some of the things that people should consider when it comes to equity and bringing on a partner. Right. Well, the nice thing, so you've got a little bit of a tax issue that, that you have to kind of work around. And so the thing that I like in the professions world, if I can pull it off, is to actually truly work off of partnership taxation rules. Because those are the most flexible, and they're there for a reason. I mean, they, these are long held. I mean, the, the, you know, partnership tax rules go back, you know, fifty years, and and there used to be more operating businesses that were partnerships. It just became more the fad of being S corps or C corps, you know, in the seventies and in the eighties, and people got away from it. But I think you're seeing more of, of the firms go back to that partnership approach. And it makes more sense in, in a sense that my profit allocation can go up or down in any year. And, that, and that's how our firm works now, the firm that we merged in with. And it, it works really well. I mean, and I think they do a really good job of maintaining it. Now, I have a capital account. And so, you know, at the beginning of each year, I, it's determined what my share of the profit allocation is going to be. And I got to go help fill that bucket. But I don't get 100 percent because there's got to be capital retained in the business to grow it and to keep the, the corporate entity you know, stable. But my capital account goes up with profits allocated. It goes down with distributions you know, sent out. And that's a that's a clean representation in a in a professions you know, partnership approach of, of, of making that work. 
It's where you get stuck in some some situations, though, where you've got people doing blended roles. And, and this especially happens in smaller practices where, you know, I'm a sole practitioner. And so what do I do to bring in that next person? And really, to be quite honest, I, I'll, I'll point people to if you just get the first book, Simple Numbers, Straight Talk with Profits and go to chapter nine. I wrote a whole chapter on how you deal with equity and, and how do you deal with earning somebody in. And the thing is, and even if you're an escort, there's a way to do, you know, that that process, you know, of, of bringing those people in. But understand that, you know, I had a client of mine years ago that made a statement that always stuck with me. And he says, my cash is cheap. My stock is expensive. And we generally turn it around the other way. And no, no, you're never going to build an enterprise value business unless you start recognizing that there is a methodology, you know, for that market value. Now, I also talk about in that chapter what I call the economic value of business. I continue, I talk a little more of it in the 2.0 book as well, in this idea that generally in the professions world, we're not likely to get the premium value that you're seeing with companies that have monthly recurring revenue and the software, the software as a service kind of companies. Generally, as a profession, we're going to stay in that three times adjusted EBITDA plus equity, you know, kind of valuation, you know, of the business, which is not bad. I mean, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great value as long as you protect profitability and, and keep it going, you know, but, but you do have to be careful and, and say, I'm not going to give it away. And, and a lot of people make a lot of bad decisions about equity because they're tax motivated. And there's ways to work through that. I mean, you just have to, you know, sometimes you diminish the value of the equity that you're giving out because you're, you're trying to, you know, work around a tax issue. And, and I, I just say taxes are taxes. I mean, just stick with value and everything works. Running your own practice can be scary. Whether you're worried about where the next case will come from, feeling like you're losing control over your growing firm, or frustrated from being out of touch with everyone working under your license, the stress can be overwhelming. We will show you how to turn that fear into a driving force of clarity, focus, stability, and confidence that eliminates the roller coaster of guilt-ridden second-guessing and mistake-making to get you off that hamster wheel for good. Maximum Lawyer and Minimum Time is a step-by-step -step playbook that shows you how to identify what your firm needs and how to proactively get it at every stage of the game so you are prepped and excited for the inevitable growth that will follow. Name the lifestyle that you want and we'll show you how to become a Maximum Lawyer in Minimum Time. Find out more by going to MaximumLawyer.com forward slash course. You're listening to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Our guest today is Greg Crabtree. He's an author, and he's on a mission to help small businesses, professional services, and entrepreneurs to figure out their finances. Greg, could you talk a little bit about the stages of a business's growth and what kind of outside financial help they need at each of those stages? Well, the, you know, the one that we've kind of become famous for is our discussion around what we call the black hole of business. And I'll tell you, the black hole is real and it fits with us in the professions world. The black hole starts at a million dollars and stays in existence until you hit five million. And the deepest, darkest moment of the black hole is a three million. And here's why. Up to a million dollars, you can cheat. You can cheat the system and wear 15 different hats and you know, keep all the plates spinning, and you don't have to invest in corporate structure to make the business work effectively. Once you cross a million, especially as you hit towards two million, you've got to start making a choice. You've got to decide, am I going to do the work? Am I going to sell the work? How good can I delegate the work? How good am I at disaggregating the project and get it to essentially the principle that we teach in profitability management is, Everybody work to their highest best rate and delegate to the available lower cost rates, you know, and, and keep those, you know, functioning. And it sounds easy to do. It's hard. It is really hard. But that's how you become profitable. And it's not about, you know, delegating down to that lowest cost rate that you know you almost kind of feel like that, hey, I'm getting a freebie here because it's like, yeah, we gotta do this, but you know, it's like, no, you got to hold yourself accountable to value creation. It's like, no, my, my lower cost people can still add great value. It's just I'm getting a good multiplier on it. And I don't want to do a task. I, I can do every task in the front. I have done every task in this front. 
but it doesn't mean I should. And I need to work to that highest, you know, best rate. And when I'm, when I delegate and I get freed up, it doesn't mean that I got more time to, to scroll through emails and, and surf the internet and look at Facebook. It means I am truly moving to higher value tasks and, and becoming more productive. You know, probably in the last three years, I have hit probably my productivity peak and I, I'm producing at a higher rate than I ever have, you know, in my career in terms of value. And it's the application of those concepts. Now, you know, the challenge is, is, as you start to add infrastructure, though, you add that next producer to delegate to, there's a natural negative economic consequence. That person isn't immediately functional and, and, and fully utilized. And, and so you've got to live through that. So it's a very delicate process of you add, you get them up to profitability, and then, okay, when's the next add? The toughest thing to add, though, is when you're adding somebody who isn't a producer, when do you add back office? When do you add that practice administrator? When do you add, you know, a bookkeeper? or, you know, financial person, you know, in, in the firm. You know, the good news is in the legal profession and in, in all the practices that we work with, generally, you know, other than probably somebody to be the, you know, probably starts off as an office manager and eventually you get into truly a practice manager, professional you know, type role, you know, you know, those are positions that you can probably do some fractional support, you know, especially in the accounting Let's face it. I mean, you know, probably for a legal practice, there's not a full-time job having an internal accountant until you get to probably four or five million in revenue. It's you know, it, it, it can be done, you know, part-time, or you can have you might have a split role. Somebody's doing some administrative function, HR, those things, and doing some bookkeeping because there's not a lot of economic activity going on unless you're just a, a practice that maybe you do a lot of trust activity and you do a lot of trust transactions. You know, those, those types of things. You know, the, the vast majority of them are not that big a deal. But there's ways to piece it together, and there's not just one way, you know, to do it. The key is you're really trying to focus on leverage. And so here, here's the magic number, you know, for everybody. At the end of the day, regardless of how much you spend for producers or back office people, I'm going to get $2 of net billable value. So if I've got any out-of-pocket costs, net those out. But for, for service, I get $2 of service revenue for every dollar of labor that I spend. That's it. That's the magic number. Everything else is noise. There, there is no magic beyond that. And if you can hold people accountable to that ratio. So, like, we, we work with personal injury lawyer practices. And so what's interesting is generally they're litigators. When we can look at the revenue generated by the litigator and what that litigator makes, and that's a lower than a two leverage. Typically, it's about a one and a half to a one point seven, but we make it up because they're the big; they get the big payday. But the case turners, the people who keep the settlements going, keep the stuff coming in, look farming that activity to find the the, the case that's worthy of taking it to court. Those people, you get a you know. A, three to you know, some of our best ones to get about a five multiplier off of those folks. And they actually make more money doing that. But but in the, the personal injury world, if you don't litigate cases, you don't you're not taken seriously in settlements. So you have to do litigation is what most of them will tell you. And, and and so there's a business model there. You know, but if you're you know maybe you're into you know doing you know probate work and, and trust work or doing just general corporate work. You know, same thing. You know, I've got to be able to, you know, to bill at that rate. On an hourly basis, it might be a four multiplier. That's a misnomer. It's really about for the year, what did you bill? For the year, what did I get paid? And and, and I got to have enough people that, that are above that two in my producer category to cover the people who don't bill. And the overall firm, let's face it, I mean, I, I can tell all your listeners right now, a really simple number to look at. You know what you're going to pay out in compensation. We're uh, recording this the first week of August. Three days ago, you knew how much you were probably going to have in payroll for the month of August. Guess what? Take that number times two, and that's how much you got to go produce this month. Find some way to do it. You got four weeks to work it out. Get after it. And if you don't do that, you're not going to be economically successful. That's great. So I'm going to sneak in one last question because I know we're going, we're getting close to time, but you mentioned something earlier on and it's a piece of advice that I know that most of us have heard, if not all of us, where, you know, zeroing out at the end of the year, you know, spend all your money. I will tell you, I've even been guilty of saying, Hey, buy your max law con tickets before the end of the year to, to help get you to that zero balance, you know, and it's, 
not good advice, right? But yes. do, will you talk about that a little bit as to why that's not good yeah. advice? So two things around that. I mean, you know, number one is, and, and I, you know, the only negative comments that I get on my Amazon reviews are people who don't like my tax position and said, listen, you know, I, I got news for you. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of smoke and mirrors about tax stuff. At the end of the day, if you didn't write a big check to the IRS, there's only two possibilities. You didn't make any money or you cheated. And both of those are bad. And so get over it. I mean, you know, just the goal is I, I want to write a seven figure check to the IRS because I know I made some money. And so to spend a dollar to save 40 cents in tax is the absolute thing that drives me nuts. And and I, I just I have to kind of watch what I say sometimes, but you know, I, I tell entrepreneurs all the time, it says, if, if the words out of your accountant's mouth in the last week of the year is, you know, you got profitability, and the first thing they say is, well, is there any equipment you need to go buy? It's like, you know, just have a bad reaction. I won't, I won't give you any suggestions of physical violence, you know, but it's like, this is just insane. You've gone 52 weeks of the year and you didn't need it. Why would you go buy it now and waste money? That's just idiotic. But the other thing that also helps is this idea of, you know, our two-month core capital target concept has been an enormously uh, strong benefit for our clients because it tells them what is the minimum amount of cash that you should never go below in the business. And it's a definitive number that will scale with you as you grow. It's not, you know, it, it's not the same number for every business, but there's a, there's a hard way we calculate it. And it has been amazing how many people have, have really used that to anchor to keep them from draining the bank account, you know, at the end of the year and making foolish purchases that really didn't add any value. And, you know, and, and, and so I, I'm really proud of what our team has been able to do to help. I mean, we, we've got, a, a, we could tell the stories publicly and then some of our clients let us tell them publicly of just the massive wealth creation that our clients have shifted to where they were like a frog trying to fly until we started working with them. And then all of a sudden they got released into their ability to be profitable and, and not only do good work for their customers and their clients, but also create wealth for their family. It's amazing. I love it. Jim, I don't know if you had another question. If not, I was going to begin to wrap things up. Greg, how do our listeners find you? Are you taking on new clients? How do they get the book? Yeah, yeah we're, we're always looking for, for clients that, you know, look for what we do. I and mean, we're kind of unique in a sense that, you know, we'll do other traditional services for our consulting clients, but you have to come through the consulting door. If somebody comes to us and just wants to do a tax return, it's like, mm, I'll refer to you one of our other CRI offices, but the, we, we have our office, unique office delivery is we start with consulting. We price it very cost effectively to, to it's a rounding error in the scheme of things, I believe, in terms of what we help people accomplish. And the easiest way to probably get in touch is if you go to simplenumbers.me, that's the book website, and there's a link to you know contact us you know on there. They can certainly reach out to me directly via email, greg.crabtree at cricpa.com. I'm probably one of the easiest people in the world to find. There's not that many great Crabtrees, so unless you find the, the former pro wrestler or the bull rider, but I think both of those have passed away. There's not many great crab trees out there. So. Well, I'm hoping we keep you around for several years to come. So no, uh, I'm going to wrap things up. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'm going to wrap things up. I don't want to, before I do, I want to remind everyone to go to the big Facebook group. Join us there. There's a lot of great information being shared on a daily basis. Uh, if you want a more high level conversation, join us in the guild, maxlawguild.com. And while you're listening to the remainder of this episode, if you don't mind giving us a five star review, we would. Greatly appreciate it. Jimmy, what's your hack of the week? As Greg mentioned, we're recording this in the first week of August of 2022, and I've been doing a fair amount of traveling lately. And let me just tell you, it's only gotten worse. Like travel was better during COVID than it is now. And two tips. One is if you can get that 6 a.m. flight, that 7 a.m. flight, the first flight of the day, book that flight because, you know, you're most likely going to have a plane there from the night before. You're most likely going to have a well-rested crew. So unless something breaks that morning on the plane, you're in pretty good shape. I think you've got to think defensively. And that brings me to my second tip, which I've heard from a couple different people. And I just did it for this weekend. And that is to have a backup ticket. With Southwest, you can get a full refund on a ticket. So we're scheduled to go out Saturday night, but I have a backup Sunday morning in case I need it because things are just crazy right now. Yeah, that's I, pretty smart, I just got Jimmy. back from... Uh, I just got back from Ireland, and I was stunned at the, the quality of service in Ireland and we were in the Killarney area for a week, and just e excellent. I mean, those, the people were 
the restaurants were fully staffed. They they were happy to see you. They were you know caring, and it's like, man, can I bring you guys back to the states? Because I, I totally 100 percent echo <laughs> your experience that I, I I'm having to fly day before, not day of. And not late in the day because I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the same thing. Uh, that's great advice. Um, Greg, I'm going to kick it back to you, though. Uh, we always ask our guests to give a tip or a hack of the week. Could it be a podcast, could be a book, could be anything. Do you have a tip or a hack for us? I just reiterate what I said earlier for all of your listening audience. You know, the business models that all of your listeners are in, I, I would challenge you to start the first day of the month, take your expected labor cost, all labor, all, everybody, regardless of the role. Take that number times two. That's your billable target for this month and get after it. Love it. Really, really good stuff. My tip of the week is it's something I've been testing out for a little bit now, and I really, really like it. It's wingassistant.com. And I was looking for a personal assistant for myself, and I went, I, I stumbled upon wingassistant.com. And they've got a, it's a really cool service. They've got an app built in. They've got tutorials where you can record videos for your assistant. And they actually meet with you in advance to look for your needs. And they find someone for you based upon your needs and, and they and they fit to your needs. And they're actually really reasonably priced. I believe for just a standard VA, it's like $7.99 a month. And that's 40 hours a week. I don't know how they do that. I've got an executive assistant. I think it's $12.99 or or thirteen ninety nine a month. Um, that's for forty hours a week, and, and and it's it's actually really reasonable. And if you have personal purchases that need to be made, they give them their own card. They will front those expenses. And I'm sure there's got to be some sort of limit, and then you just pay that out of your account at the end of the month. So they're not getting your personal credit card. They're not getting your anything to pay for your expenses. So it's actually it's a pretty cool process. Pretty cool uh, product too. So I do recommend that. Uh, Greg, thank you so much for coming on. I learned a lot on this episode, even though I've read your book. I need to read 2.0. I've not read that, but great stuff. And, Love it. Thank and you. They're now both available on audio as well. I went in the studio and read both of them. So nice. Nice. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much, Greg. We'll see you. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. The Maximum Lawyer Podcast. To stay in contact with your host and to access more content, more content. go to MaximumLawyer.com. Maximum Have a great week and catch you next time.